doors 155. The Honourable Member for Murchison. Thank you, Madam Deputy <coughs> Chair. May I just place the amendment if you want? Um, Sorry, it's a bit hard on being in the chair all the time. I haven't got my papers in order, so I do apologise. Um, so, yeah. So, through you, Madam Deputy Chair, this amendment, this is a request from Emerald Going Very First. Yeah, the request for amendment um, on um, it's clause 105, page 204. Um, now, just to explain the context of this a little bit before I actually move it, um, a request for an amendment it is being proposed here um, because it's a request to introduce a, basically a tax or a levy um, that extracts um, money, yeah, money that this House has no power to do. Okay, so or no, ha no power to do by amendment or even to introduce a bill to do that. We can't do that in this place. Constitutionally, we can't. And it's the same with when we deal with money bills um, and the other tax bill. So the process here is that, uh, um, that I ask for the members' consideration that we, we, we request the House of Assembly to make an amendment to the legislation. And the process by which that happens is that um, if the request for amendment is agreed by this place. A message is sent to the, the other place with asking the other, other place to consider that request. They could say no. They probably will. <laughs> but I think um, it, the, the reason I'm putting this up as a asking for them to consider this is this is a much fairer um, distribution of the profits from the um, EGMs in pubs, um, and that's the reality. And it, so it, it, it certainly meets the objects of the Act in terms of the uh, more appropriate distribution and fair distribution of the profits. Um, and so that's, that's why it's been done this way. If the House of Assembly were to accept the request, they would send a message back to us. And this happens before we get to the third reading too. Okay, so it goes by way of message to the House of Assembly for the request was agreed to. The House of Assembly would consider that request, um, obviously next week when they were back, uh, and then it would, they would send a message back saying they either accepted the request and thus would amend the bill, or they wouldn't. And then it's up to this House to determine whether we would press that request. Okay, um, but that's the process. So just, so I just want to make that clear for everybody. So, Madam De Deputy Chair, I'll um, move this request for amendment, and then I'll speak. And you'll move both of them? Just the one. Just the one. There's, oh, just the one. There's just, yeah, it is one whole request, like X and Y. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Okay. Through you, Madam Deputy Chair, just before you start, if you could clarify. Mm. So, do we then, once if this passes, do we then postpone the clause? No, you continue on, you continue on and a request is sent. Yeah, but if we can't move past, we'd have to be able to move past this clause, wouldn't yeah, but we? it's not your choice. I'll let the Deputy Clerk, uh, or the um, Deputy Chair provide that advice. Through <coughs> you. The process is that the, if the request is agreed to by the House, then the message can be sent to the other place, but the clause is also needs to be agreed to. Can we continue to deal with clauses? Yes, yes. 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 Yeah. And, the, and the, the question would then be the that the... Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. And the clause is agreed to subject to the request. That's right. OK. Yeah. Thank you. So, so that would be the question, the clause be agreed to, subject to request. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yeah. I hope that's clear to members. They understand the process. Yeah. OK, so... Um, Madam Deputy Chair, clause 
155, page 104, that the House of Assembly be requested to amend clause 155 by inserting the following subsections after subsection 1 in the proposed new section 148. X, the annual licence fee payable for a game machine authority endorsed on a venue licence for licence premises in any year, the relevant year is A, if in the last 12 month period immediately preceding the relevant year, the average gross profit for the licence premises for that period is one, less than $20,000, $1, and two, $20,000 or, or more, but less than $40,000, $1, plus 10% of each dollar of those average gross profits over 20000 and three, $40,000 or more, but less than $60,000, $2,001 plus 20% of each dollar of those average gross profits over $40,000. And for $60,000 or more in the 12-month period immediately preceding the relevant year, $6,001 plus 30% of each dollar of those average gross profits over 60000 And B, if there are no average gross profit amounts for the relevant licence premises for the 12-month period immediately preceding the relevant year, $1,000. And why? For the purpose of subsection X, the average gross profit for licensed premises in a 12-month period before in a relevant year within the meaning of that subsection is calculated by dividing the total gross profit during the 12-month period that are derived from all gaming machines in the licensed premises by the maximum number of gaming machines in the licensed premises at any one time during the 12-month period. Okay, so just to speak to that, explain a couple of provisions in that before I speak to the, the rationale behind the, um, the, state, the um, stepped provisions. Um, part B there is um, basically the, 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 what, would, what is occurring now in the bill. If it's a new venue, for example, and there's no profits um, from previous year, the immediate year, pay $1,000. Okay. The others, um, and you don't have, don't have to worry about with the first one because um, they're not only going to pay a dollar because there's no, if, if they're not making at least $20,000, they're, they're, they're out the back door. Okay, that's the break even point. So, um, and the, the average gross profit is uh, calculated in the way it is. So, if a venue got, um, had, so they started off the year with, let's say, 10 machines and went down to five during that year, they would actually pay less because it's um, at a point of time when they've got the most, um, their profits will be less, so they'd get, it'd be, it's fairer that way. So, Madam Deputy Chair, I sent to members, um, well, a week ago nearly, yeah. something like that. <laughs> Seems like I don't know how long ago. Um, some, some some information to support this stepped approach to taxing the player losses or the revenues, the profit from the machines um, in pubs. Now I, I'm going to read part of this, but I'm also going to seek leave to have it ta tabled and incorporated into hand sign. There's a lot of figures in here. I think it's the only way to truly reflect what I'm putting. But I know all members have got copies of this, and, and I know the government has got it as well. So, Mr. President, what I, Madam Deputy Chair, what I'm seeking to do here is to provide um, more of these super profits back to the government and thus to the community. So, the, as, the, as the information that has been provided to the, to the um, members, that there's a table on, the, on page three that shows the um, estimations based on the, current, the loss figures from the Commonwealth Grants Commission's information themselves um, and confirmed by other information collected by the, mem uh, the Member Percy's um, committee in terms of the um, fixed and variable costs. Um, and I explained that very fully in my contribution on the floor, so that's all on the record, so I'm not going to repeat any of that. But the table shows that um, the, for the, for the, in the current model, and even this, these figures are slightly out in terms of what the variable or fixed costs are, they'll, be, they'll vary the same up or down. So it won't actually change the ratios or percentages of what you see here. So as you can see from some of the um, pubs that the high um, loss pubs, high losses, player losses, that is, so high profits 
for the for the pubs um, with 30 EGMs. Under the current model, if, there were, if the losses were $100,000, and this is where we're looking at pubs like the Elwick Hotel, Top of the Town, um, and others in that category, um, under the current arrangement, um, because it, that's $100,000 were losses per EGM, 30 EGMs, that's $3 million. Pretty simple to work out. The current situation, that, that before we do anything, before any legislation is passed in this place, their current profits um, equate to $461,535. Under the proposed legislation that we're dealing with, what's before you that we're dealing with here, those pubs will get $967,500, which is a significant uplift. So the super profits there are extraordinary. And that's top of the town, just down the road from the Montello Primary School. Or up the road, sorry. Up the road and over the hill. More than double. Yeah, so um, ver proposed version two, which is what I'm putting to you here by way of this request, um, would see that that um, pub get $479,970. Still significantly more than under the current arrangement. No pub is worse off under this arrangement. Okay? Some are obviously better off than others. Um, but it, it's certainly less than what this bill would give them. No, no two ways about that, and that's the intention. That's the intention, is to claw back some of those super profits. When you go down to the bottom of that table um, where you see there are lower losses, and these are some of the pubs I talked about, like in the electorate of McIntyre, in my own electorate, the, some of these smaller pubs have fewer machines and lower player losses. Um, you'll see there that these buns actually benefit by this model. Because they're less profitable, there's less clawed back. And that's only right, that's only fair. And without my, amend my request for amendment, these pubs will really struggle to make ends meet. And as you can see, those red figures in the bottom of the um, table there, um, they show that some of those pubs will not be profitable. Under the current model, they will not be profitable. Under the, my proposed version, they will be profitable. So is it fair that some of these really big pubs make an absolute killing on this? More than double what they're getting now? And other little pubs get less and potentially go under or have to get rid of their pogies and try and survive other ways? Some might say that's a good outcome. I, for me, it's not because these pubs rely on this... Um, as a member of McIntyre will know, some of these little pubs that I've got down the west coast and she's got on her east coast, um, they do rely on it, whether you like the impact or not. Um, but that's, that, that's the, the cold, harsh reality. So, Madam Deputy Chair, I just want to read a few, bit of this and then seek leave to table the rest. So, just to, by way of, way of explanation, I've quoted some of the figures, only a couple of them. This note covers a comparison of version... Uh, current versus proposed versus my proposal, proposal version two. Proposed is as per the um, FGM proposals in the current bill. Okay, so when you look at the proposed model, that's what's proposed under the bill we're looking at. Proposed version two, which is what I'm proposing, includes a sliding scale slash stepped licence fees designed to raise revenue that would otherwise that otherwise would have been raised. In theory, by a properly considered tender system for EGM licences. That was what was first considered by the government as the model. The decision was made to do it this way that there's now proposed in this bill. So, and we end up with those super profits. Under my proposed version two, the licence fee schedule can be found at the end of this note, and I will table that in just a moment. So, just to, in, in terms of calculating the gaming profits, estimates, as I've said, were made of the fixed and variable costs that relate to EGM gaming operations. Other than licence fees that will vary between venues and are known both proposed and proposed version two, the other fixed and variable costs are assumed to be the same across all venues. While this is somewhat unrealistic and leaves a model open to criticism, it does not invalidate the compa comparison between the current proposed and proposed version two, which is the aim of the exercise. So, um, Madam Deputy Chair, that's... I'll, I'll table all those figures so they can sit in amongst that. So just going back to those figures I 
um, spoke about, there's a couple of pubs that fall into the first category of EGMs with $100,000, probably about eight, um, so, uh, of which they have about $85,000 losses. These are the pubs in the Glorky local government area, one in the Mersey electorate um, and one in Pembroke. The state average or mean loss it was $50,000 per EGM in 2020-21. Um, that's going from the information that's, pub that's available. Um, through the Gaming Commission. Because of the skewed distribution of losses, and I talked about this in my second reading speech, how it's, it's not an even distribution of player losses, um, in favour of the better performing venues, the median loss was approximately $40,000 per EGM. Federal Hotel's 12 Vantage Group pubs would have averaged at least $80,000 in losses per EGM, so quite profitable. Um, other multi-venue owners, Endeavour Group, A or ALH, Callis Group, Dixon Hotel Group and, and Goodstone Group account for a lot of the pubs where losses were per EGM will vary around the state average, around $35,000 to $60,000. And there are estimated 20 small venues with 300 EGM in total, and these losses per EGM were less than $25,000 per annum. So, as a result of the bill, the net profits from gaming were more than double except for those with very low player losses in per EGM, whose situation will clearly and certainly be made worse. All the above average pubs are very profitable under the current system. They're profitable now um, and producing profits far in excess of their colleagues in the food and beverage industry. So you've got... What the government's here is handing out a massive big uplift for pubs um, in these high-performing area of pubs that are competing against pubs that also would want to attract customers through their food and beverage services alone, or maybe some accommodation in some of them. But these pubs are getting a massive uplift. And when we hear from the industry um, representatives who, who briefed us that um, they will upgrade their facilities and things like that, and they're just waiting for the tick, they can still do it under my proposal. They'll still get bigger profits. Um, but what it means is that they'll, they'll also, they will be distributed more, more um, evenly across. Um, so um, I just want to refer just briefly to some comments made by the industry players when they briefed this. Here we go. So the industry, um, when we had Ben Carpenter from the Beach Hotel in my electorate um, and um, Michael Best, Best, that's right, sorry, sorry I'm right on here, from the Goodstone Group, um, they, they provided a submission about what some of the matters they spoke about. And in that submission, that they, when they spoke to us, they said they provide this, this document. And it says, interestingly, we're asked to take a short survey across a cross-section of gaming venues where the and the following, the following findings were present. It was noticeably clear venues that choose to operate gaming use gaming revenue to assist with the operation of other areas throughout their whole business. Okay, so they rely on the gaming sector to assist for the rest of their business. Most venues have more than one form of gaming and advise they would use the income from gaming to provide more sponsorship, support their local clubs, associations and communities, along with, the, with free use of facilities and equipment. That's fantastic that they do that. They can still do that. They can do that even better because they have more money under my proposed version. Which was, what, was very, is, what was very apparent in regional venues with gaming relying on gaming revenues to employ some staff and operate for longer hours over more days of the week, this provides more hours for staff in those areas and increased wages. For an operator to be able to provide better job certainty with better wages can only serve to provide confidence in the locality. That will still occur, even more so because they'll be better off under my proposed version than they are now. Gaming revenues also assist regional, uh, regional venues to provide better services to the community. Same point. They went on a bit further on to say, it is also important to note that many businesses th that have gaming can have high debt levels, whereby banks have provided borrowings to operators based on the valuation of their business incorporating the profit con con contribution from gaming. This means that if gaming in the venue is stopped or negatively impacted, the ability of the operator to repay the debt is severely affected and would force lenders to call in the loans. This would have a significant impact on a, effect sorry, on employment, taxation and community expenditure. Conversely, if any, any amendment to gaming is positively impact, impacted, 
valuations will increase, and this will enable banks slash finances to offer additional capital to operators to enable improvements to their venues. Okay, clearly very important. Um, that's why we need to get it right in the first place. They can still be able to, um, their, their value will still be in their business. In fact, their value will be greater in these businesses. Um, Mr Carbett will be able to spend money on his venue, um, as he's got waiting to do, so he, as he tells us. Um, he, will be able, he will have more money to do it with than, what was, than, he, than he's currently expecting or be getting. Okay, so what this does is it actually creates a f fairer return to the community or to the government who are, who are acting on behalf of the community here. Um, it means that it's, it provides a more level and even playing field for all pubs in these little communities and towns where some may have pokies and some may not. Um, then I'm sure all the pubs would like to have a bit of a, um, a, a revenue boost to do some work in their pubs. I'm sure all of them would value that. Um, this spreads that more evenly and makes it a fairer competitive environment. Um, and it doesn't disadvantage any of the pubs from their current position now. In fact, it will probably help some of those um, smaller um, hotels with um, lower player losses. So I do urge members to consider at least giving this the opportunity to be considered by the lower house. They're the house that makes the, um, the decisions uh, about you know, supply, about money bills, about taxation. I know this, this proposal has been for, brought forward to us. The original position of the government was to provide um, a different approach that would have created um, a model similar to what I'm proposing now, but they went down a path that created this enormously uneven distribution that will basically flow to those four or five big players, as, as I mentioned, to, the, um, to Federal Group, Hoodstone, Callis Group, Dixon Group and um, AHL. Uh, and I ask you, is that, is that what is, was intended? Is that what the people of Tasmania... Sorry, not AHL, ALH. Is that what the people of Tasmania expected? Um, is that what they thought was happening? They thought they were breaking the monopoly and getting rid of um, the federal largesse. Well, it does get rid of the federal largesse in one sector, but it gives them back to, back to them in this. It gives it to a small group of players and will encourage the other players, like the Endeavour Group, to come in and buy up those pool pubs to reduce their, overall, their overhead costs so they can um, be, be more profitable. So I ask you to really consider asking the lower house to consider this as an alternative option. Before we sit down, um, were you going to table something there? Oh, thank you, yeah. Ben for Mersey. Um, I seek leave to table this document and have it incorporated into Hansard in my speech on this amendment uh, because it contains a number of um, tables of figures that I can't really read out and Hansard to do justice to. Question is, is leave granted? Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Country no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Leader. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. So this amendment is not supported. Licence fees have been set in a fixed and progressive manner per machine of between $1,000 to $2,500 in line with the <coughs> government's policy, with larger venues paying significantly more. The fees have been set at a level that provides for a sustainable industry, recognises the cost of regulation and gives government an ongoing revenue stream through increased licence fees rather than a one-off licence fee payment. The question is that the... I'll say it the um, I hope the Labor Party will um, speak on this request, uh, not a member for Hewan necessarily, um, even though he's still a Labor Party member, but he's not... He's not um, proposing the Labor Party's position on these things at the moment, as we can all clearly see. Um, because I think it's really important that um, we hear... If, they, if the Labor Party members in this House just get up and, and vote without any, con any comment, it does not give any of the people of Tasmania any idea of what they're thinking around this, whether they're willing to even have another model considered. So um, I hope we do hear from a Labor Party member. But, Madam Deputy Chair, just a few points I want to come back to um, as, and reiterate some of the comments that have been made to a degree, but not to re-prosecute them. But this is a request to send it to the House of Assembly for consideration. And I agree with the member, um, the De Deputy Chair's comments when she was speaking um, as a member of McIntyre um, that 
we, it hasn't had time to be looked at in, in, in full, um, and it wasn't sent to public accounts committee where these sort of things could have been um, had a good light shone on them. Okay, but that didn't occur, and we have to try and do it here. I did send this information out to all members. I sent it the same day to the um, finance spokesperson for the Labor Party. Um, and I also um, offered to send it to the minister directly um, to and, and see, sought <coughs> an opportunity to discuss that with him. He, on the same day, or well, actually the day before I sent it to members, I wanted to give the minister and the um, opposition uh, spokesperson um, an earlier heads up. I got it while I was sitting in the chair before dinner break. I got a text message from the minister saying, "Sorry about the delay." Um, yeah, haven't um, haven't taken up the offer. Nice to get the offer. Haven't taken it up. He's relying on his staff member, or his advisor, or chief staff, whatever the Mr. Gillies' title is, um, to deal with that. Now, Mr. Gillies hasn't reached out either to have a chat about it. Disappointingly, because we could have actually talked about some of this stuff. So I asked the leader to table the modelling that the government have done <coughs> to to. Um, illustrate the outcomes on the various venues with their various player losses to demonstrate what their, the, um, their, their profits will be. And what the, under, the, under the proposed arrangement, I've given my estimate of it, as you've seen quite clearly, <coughs> based on the information that's publicly available, um, and I ask the, the government to do the same. I've shown you mine, you show me yours. Okay. And I'm happy to wait while the leader gets that and puts it on the table for us so we can have a look. OK. Um, and then we can perhaps compare notes. It's hard to do it without that. <coughs> I gave the heads up over a week ago to both parties. OK. So I'll, I'll expect that before we finish this debate um, so we can actually have a proper look. The current model that the government are proposing is not based on profitability. It's based on number of machines. It has no progressivity really of any measure in it. Uh, it just relates to the number of machines. More machines you're paying more. That's not progressivity. This, what I'm proposing, is progressivity. It picks up the super profits or the super normal profits, as the member for Nelson was referring to them as. Um, once you get past the break-even point, it's pure cream on top. And the further above the break-even point, which I've, I've considered to be around $20,000 per machine, um, then it's absolute cream. So there's a few getting lots and lots of cream at the top, and there are some down the bottom, small pubs in our regions um, in, um, that are not. So... This version that I'm proposing to you will return some of the profits to the community while leasing, leaving none of the pubs worse off than what they are now. They'll all be better off. The smaller pubs will be slightly better off than the bigger pubs. But that's fair because the bigger pubs have got, they've got less overheads. They're owned by the same people. They've got less overheads. So it's clearly a much fairer system based on the gross profits. We, we, uh, we tax uh, or raise revenue based on gross profits in other areas. They're doing it in other areas of the bill. There's other references to gross profits in the bill. Have a look at them. You'll find them there. So at the, at the bottom end of the market, the AGM market, these are venues that have lower losses. Okay, and these are, um, they have lower losses and fewer AGMs and they're situated in more remote locations. And the table clearly reveals that and the real risks to those venues if we proceed with the model before us. And that's why I'm asking you to, and the Labor Party particularly, to refer this back to the government to have a look at it, to do the modelling, to see if, it, if it's fair, to see if it works and see if it fits in with the objects of the bill. We're not asking you to agree to it. We're asking the Labor Party to agree to it. I, there's no way I'm asking them to agree to it. I'm not asking any member here to agree to it. I'm asking them you to agree to send it back downstairs and get the government to have a look at it. You show me my, you show me yours, I've shown you mine. While you're on your feet, Honourable, 
This um, model that's put on the table, yeah. there's examples of that used in other states and jurisdictions with... with um, well, there are... Yeah, look, look, um, there is other, ev other information I've got here that talks about different tax rates in states and territories. Um, and they, they all use different models. Yeah. But there are different ones that have different levels of progressivity in them. Yes. South Australia, for example, um, this is the for uh, state and territory electronic game machines taxes. South Australia, for example, um, the, the tax base tax based on annual net gambling revenue in a financial year, same measure basically, zero to seventy five seventy five thousand dollars nil, seventy five thousand seventy five thousand and one dollar to three hundred ninety nine thousand dollars, twenty one percent of excess for the profits, um, three hundred ninety nine thousand and one dollar to nine hundred forty five thousand dollars. $68,040 plus 28.5% of excess, and on it goes. So there are similar models, yes. Yeah, so where you've requested the government, they should be able to provide their modelling, because they should have looked at all these different... Yeah, yeah, well, you would have thought so. This, this was in the... Um, uh, the ACIL Allen Consulting Report um, of 2017, the fourth economic and social impact study of gambling in Tasmania. 2017, Volume 1, Industry Trends and Impacts. So that's, that's it. Um, so the aim of this, this um, proposed um, model, uh, that what I'm proposing to be considered by the government, is to achieve a more appropriate share for the community, to, giving, to give a helping hand to smaller remote venues and to remove some of the super profits from an already very profitable part of the gaming sector. They're already profitable. The evidence that is there under the current arrangements is all there in front of you. Much, as, as I said previously, much of the public discussion focused on the breaking of federal government's federal sorry hotels monopoly, and attention is diverted away from the existing super profits in the industry. If the industry is to claim extra super profits are needed to upgrade their businesses, they need to show how the super profits earned by them over the last 25 years ha have been spent, because they have been earning profits above certainly well above break-even. Um, and they're also competing with the other pubs in town who don't have these machines. And, and they would also like a handout from the government to do some um, upgrades to their facilities and venues, I'm sure. So, uh, I'm uh, thankfully, I haven't had a tripwire set up at the, uh, the top of the road yet <laughs> outside the THA offices. Um, but I'd, I might be on the way home tonight, most likely. But... <laughs> All, the, the reality is that, as I understand it, the THA represent all venues. Why aren't they speaking up for these small venues that are likely to become unprofitable under, this, under the model that's proposed? Why aren't they speaking up for all the pubs and clubs that they're slogging their guts out, relying on food and beverage? Because when we go back to Mr Carpenter's statement, um, he said here... One, one um, quote from the venue operator was, without gambling, uh, without our gaming business, which employs 16 people, we would not be profitable. That's the one I was referring to in my second reading speech. Yeah. So, and also, another bit of feedback from his survey was that our venue has been able to do $4 million of renovations the last 10 years. Don't tell me they're not profitable on the current arrangement. Okay. They're going to get more than this under the model I'm proposing. Another one. We purchased, renovated and built 13 new accommodation units at a cost of $5 million. Hmm, that's a nice little profit too. Unfort and another comment. Unfortunately, bar, bottle shop and food sales will not give us the profit to carry out all these activities. And so clearly, they're saying that that's not profitable enough for them to carry out their, their um, business upgrades. What about the pub down the road? The ones at THA, I understand, also represent. So I'm sure the tripwire is being set up now as we speak. So, <laughs> um, so I, I think I want to make it clear that whilst this is newish information, I was hoping it would go to PAC to, be, to have a look at it. It hasn't. That's fine. We can work through it now. But this is the way to work for it. Send it back to the government. Ask them to have a look at it. Show me your modelling. I've shown you mine. Um, and that's the only way we can actually have a proper debate about this, because I don't, tr I don't believe, I don't um, expect everyone just to trust my figures based on the fact that I've given them to you. I stand by them. I do not resolve from them. I can verify them and back them. 
but I believe that, that to be properly looked at, the government should take them back and have a look and see if this model actually is a much fairer and sensible model that meets every objective of the bill, sees every venue better off, and hopefully we'll see some of our little pubs and clubs in our region not fall over. And aren't they interested in small business? I thought they were. I certainly am. In the small ones in my electorate, I know that. So I urge you not to get tied up on whether, you want to, whether we should support this model or not, but send it back to the government and let them have a look. And I hope the Labor Party will support this, because I'm not asking them to support it. I'm asking them to say, yes, give it to the government, let them have a look. You show me mine, you show me yours, because I've shown you mine. I still have one more call left, Mr. Well, one or at least, maybe two. The question is, that the question, the Honourable Member for McIntyre. Acting Chair, 